the crypto side, I think, I think it'll be a stealth piece, right? I think it'll 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 be more like people focus on just the game itself and oh, all the stuff that I can do here, but I can't do elsewhere. And then all, all the like DJs like ourselves who are you know in the wings, like I told you so. Uh, nobody will care because it'll be the the hundreds of millions of people that only care about what they can do. And then why can't this other game do these same things? Like that that will be what they actually care about. Can you briefly explain just a little bit about like who you are and, and what Shrapnel is? Yeah, I mean, I am, you know, I'm Don Norbury. I'm the studio head for Shrapnel. I'm the CTO for Neon. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been making games, AAA games for about 20 years now, everything from, uh, sports titles like Madden NFL, NCAA, um, worked on some film stuff like Indiana Jones and star Wars for a little while. What? Uh, did, uh, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would never give up those days, days for anything. Like it was a little hectic at Luke Lucasfilm. It's kind of a crazy place to work, but you're just surrounded by film memorabilia, like a legit uh, they have like the compositing camera that was used to make Empire Strikes Back and stuff like Whoa. that. And you're just, <laughs> it, you just see it every day, like wandering around there, you know. Uh, plus those franchises, especially back when I worked on them, because I'm old, uh, were still like, you know, had a lot of heart to them. So uh, I lo love that. But then, you know, I uh, kind of coast to coast, you know, I was in San Francisco, um, worked in Boston, a place called Irrational Games, uh, on a game called Bioshock. And then um, worked in publishing at Xbox for about six years. So did Sunset Overdrive, Rise, Son of Rome, Quantum Break, um, some Age of Empires reboot stuff, uh, and a game called Crackdown 3. And then HBO is where I met all of the founders for Neon uh, and how we kind of created the company that that now has birthed Shrapnel. Um, and sh of course, Shrapnel is a, um, a you know, FPS extraction game, so something like Escape from Tarkov or... Uh, um, you know, like the, the multiplayer mode in um, the division, uh, the dark zone, I think it's called like that, that style of game. Um, but you can lose your loadout, you kind of decide what you were going to bring in. If you if you die, somebody or somebody kills you, they can take your, you know, your loot off your corpse. But it's also high stakes treasure hunting, you're getting in trying to find the most valuable stuff and then get out with it. Uh, so unlike Battle Royale, though, there's also like multiple winners, there's multiple ways to extract over the course of the session. So it's not just that like, you know, pinnacle last person in the circle at the end. There's kind of a lot of different play styles that um, culminate over the course of the session. Um, and then all of that's wrapped with a UGC framework. So it allows people to create their brand, uh, create weapon skins and equipment skins, and then build their own maps that other people can play and kind of compete with each other uh, with a reward structure that we have for making the best stuff that people love. Obviously, you guys are like a world-class AAA team. Why did you guys choose to build a crypto game over just a normal game? Uh, I mean, so the, in the beginnings uh, of the kind of shrapnel twinkle in eye, um, uh, the idea around the extraction shooter and the UGC side of it was something that we had been bouncing around for a while. And it was mostly because um, we saw this kind of generation that came out of Minecraft and Roblox uh, kind of aging up into these tool sets that are declarative tool sets, and, you know, incrementally more complicated. But there's kind of a, a generation that, that just like expects that and they've been creating um, their entire lives, right? And those people don't just stop creating. And we kind of saw this wall that people would hit that's that's like in the gaming space, there's not um, something for them to age into that has some of the like mature maturity to it, right? Like a, a little bit of a like serious tone, not just a sandbox, but something that people like are drawn to fictionally, world building, the aesthetic, like all of these things. Um, as opposed to just giving people the most horrifying thing ever, which is the blank slate or the blue sky, right? You like start with something and then people flourish from kind of a creativity perspective. Um, so we, I think we like, kind of shared this vision because we all are, again, old enough to where like we kind of got into the game industry by modding games back in the day. For me, it was like the OG Neverwinter Nights. I know for some of the people I've talked to here, it's like Quake and stuff like that. So that was like the nostalgia glasses about kind of our journey into the game industry. Um, and that was that was always the inception of Shrapnel. The blockchain side was was when we, we started getting um, 
uh, advisements. They wanted us to advise from a game expert perspective on blockchain projects. Uh, and that, that was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a tech, I come from a technical background and it had been since like Satoshi white paper uh, and nerding out on like consensus mechanisms and everything and how that worked um, that I had really like dug deep again. So, you know, a few years ago, this all started spinning up and, you know, being the way I am, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get into this, you know, baby's first solidity contract and stuff like that. Uh, and then um, how it connect connected with games and this vision that we had of kind of, you're going to make this thing, that's yours, like ownership. And I, you know, I have a, um, I'll say like libertarian streak for lack of a, be a better way of putting it uh, as well. So the further we got into it, I'm like, Dude, this isn't like if, this is when. And there's, <laughs> there is at the time, at least very little, like nothing to very little in terms of um, the type of of craft that we're used to doing in this space at all right um, and we could see why like mm, risk and like regulatory unease and these big publishers aren't going to stick their necks out they have you know millions of existing customers um so we're like this is the perfect opportunity for us to get into this and do this with this thing that we've had for a while and have been formulating um, and of course like our first versions we're relatively naive about how we thought about it. And then it's been maturing ever since. Um, but the, you know, the original shape, I would say still has this kind of startling uh, similarity. And, you know, especially in the case of like, people make stuff, you experience it, there's a reward structure, like that's all the same, like the, the ownership and transaction side of it. Um, I think where it's matured is, is very much around, and this is a, a game dev, a AAA game dev thing, where it's like, how do we make it as frictionless as possible? We want, no matter what type of cohort of of player, creator, investor, speculator, promoter, whatever you are, we want you to be able to get in and and like be as effective as possible, have the most fun you know in your own space as possible, um, right from the get go. And I think that's where a lot of our kind of elegance has improved over time, and we'll continue you know making it better and better. What would you say the main benefits to a crypto game are versus like a traditional game? It's I mean it's. To me, and I actually gave a talk about this uh, at GDC last year, which is for me, like blockchain is the TCP, what TCP IP is to the internet, blockchain is to ownership and transactions. And of course, there will be, um, we're seeing all sorts of interesting expressions that continue into that space, but it's, you know, it's a shared state system it's a, a shared ledger you know people often describe it that way so if you're not if that's not the thing you're focusing on like i don't know why you would be building on blockchain right it's like that is the thing um so like for us the thing that it brings is the true digital ownership we have a lot of focus on interoperability transportability right the uh, um, even at our kind of protocol level the infrastructure we have a code name gamebridge is like the platform we're building in the background um, all of those things are the focus of how we build everything. Um, so, you know, if, for me, it's um, it's very much the expression of those things. You can say like, oh, digital ownership, but what you can actually do with stuff is is important. And up till now, it's been a lot of like collecting or membership stuff. Um, you can see kind of the um, the the open market initiative, you know, and the, the ability to kind of move stuff around. The, the next like obvious thing, people use like metaverse a lot. To me, it's like multiverse, which is how do we work with other partners and projects to have like cross compatibility and cross transportability of ownership and assets? Because then it's like you can actually do more stuff with the stuff that you have. And that that is important. Like that agency is important. Um, so I think that's that's the the like part will, where people's brains will click over and like, oh, that thing Ubisoft tries to do with like Uplay and you know across their titles, this is like the legit version instead of an afterthought. Um, uh, and then I think you know uh, uh, we can't forget the like speculator investor side of it either, right? Like as much as people are like, no, we have to focus on just the gamer. I'm like, yeah, like for our team, that's table stakes. The game has to be fun, has to be dope. Players, we haven't, we you know, we want tens of millions of players, hundreds of millions of players, not like a niche of, you know, the web three audience, um, uh, like only at least we've been catering very much to them initially, but in order to do that, they need to like come in and just experience it fric uh, frictionlessly, but there's still the, the like 
speculator investor community that will be there that lifts the whole thing up from the bottom, right? So the people that that traditionally would have gone into some other title that's a walled garden, they're bound by that wall garden, right? And they can do play play and create and get their you know thumbs up, their likes and their stars and whatever. Um, but this creates an ecosystem where those people get to turn into the next like creator superstars. And, we, and it only is made possible by the fact that that other cohort that really couldn't be involved other than like black and gray market stuff is a natural organic part of the actual ecosystem. Makes me think of like Axie Infinity. So I always go back to it because it is like, <clears throat> have, have you actually played Axie Infinity? I've watched people play. I don't have any Axies. Play. Yeah. Yep. It, it's, you know, why Lee was panned is like not a fun game. Um, back when you ri originally like started, you had to like get a crypto wallet, you had to fund your crypto wallet, you had to bridge over your assets. Like it was a really complicated thing to get started with. It was not a very fun game. And yet, despite that, like at its height, it had 2.7, it was like 2.3 or 2.7 million active players a month, which that's insane to me. Okay, so like, that, that's that's huge like I, I mean you're in the gaming space and so you know like that's a lot of players to be playing a game that's not fun and what so what was the primary driver of that the primary driver of that was that speculative use case you're talking about because that it, that's sort of like a new sort of game mechanic and that like um it, it i wouldn't even call it speculative i'd call it like it's the same mechanic that draws people to open pokemon cards they're speculating on i want to get uh, you know, X rarity card, and it could be worth value in the future. It's the same thing with like Magic the Gathering cards. And th this has existed um, for a long time. It's just it's never been able to come into video games in a meaningful way until we had the blockchain. And we had the ability for digital ownership, and so I I'm with you. I think just like you think that like um, you know, crypto gaming is is bound to take over just because there is this new element introduced that i think a lot of people are discounting because they're thinking it's like sort of like play to play to win or sort of or, or sorry pay to win but but inherently what it is is it's just a different type of collectible collectible mechanic that goes into games that actually gives players more rights than they had before would that be yeah. a good way to say it yeah yeah and make again it's like and makes it easier and more legitimized from like a marketplace perspective right Markets are going to exist no matter what. Like nobody can stop them no matter what. It's just a natural part of, of human connection and the way we work as a society and tribes. Um, so, you know, like legitimizing it, having out in the open, right, makes perfect sense. And, and you know, Axie, uh, a lot of people like poo-poo on Axie still to this day, but like you got to start somewhere. It is, it's a simple refined mechanism that's very obvious like how it all works you don't need you know a, a high level math degree to like model it all out um you, like you, that's where you start so uh i i think obviously like from a wider adoption gaming perspective when you go beyond kind of that that style of simplified mo like mobile game uh and the the whatever they called them the not guilds but the um <laughs> The scholarships or something like that right that, that ended up getting created because of the price of entry uh into something like Axie. but there's like an entire city state for lack of a, a better way of putting yeah. it that have ev ev like evolved around this notion and, and this type of game and like you can't say that that like it's clearly there's something there that everyone should take note of and remember as we move forward but um yeah i've, I've i think that's a great well, example and, fully and that's why it was such a great example was because it didn't have a ton more than that. Like the only thing it had was the the element, uh, the crypto element. And that's like, outside of that, it was pretty bare bones. It was like a, a proof of concept using the crypto element. And then like, you know, they, they strapped a little bit on there, but, but not much. And that's what's so amazing to me is like, you have this initial proof of concept that kind of took the world by storm as far as, far as things went. Well, and what's gonna happen when you have a game like Shrapnel that does it, that's like, you know, the matured, you know, grown up version of it that's like taking it, you know, it's it's a good game on its own right. Like you take the crypto element out of it, this looks like a really fun game. And so yeah. the crypto element is just like, you're like combining these two formulas and like what you're gonna get, I don't think anyone knows right now because we've never seen it, but- yeah. um, I've described it repeatedly as a grand experiment, but we're, we, you know, 
we're taking a very disciplined approach into not just designing the game, but the economy um, uh, from a like product perspective, macro and microeconomics to make sure like, A, it's a free to play game, right? You don't have to, like right now we're in early access. So you have to buy extraction packs and those people, it's going to be the, the next year or so basically of incremental rollout. And as we evolve, and one of the things we're doing as we evolve over time is pulling in more and more of um, those economic pillars because we've got like a slew of them because you have to have like a ton of them and you need to be hyper aware of the isolation of them purposeful isolation so that one tipping over doesn't tip over a whole bunch right uh, and the game can stand on itself and be healthy economically for all of these different cohorts and the way people play so um, like that will be an it, it is a grand experiment where we're doing it responsibly uh, in a way that's like mitigates and hedges each step of the way so if something doesn't work we can um, not necessarily like peel it back but start to focus and lean on something else and then you know determine our head of economy gets to determine how we evolve over time just to like make sure we have the best product possible so from your perspective which is probably one of the best that there could be seeing your like kind of wide range of games and your career in the gaming industry do you picture crypto gaming I hear a lot of people say that it'll never take off, that there's no potential in it. Um, <laughs> I hear a lot of other people say, yeah, it'll be a thing, but it'll be like a really niche thing. It'll be really small. Um, do you see it as like a, a niche or is it in your mind, the future of gaming period? I I mean, calling it the future of gaming, I think is also hyperbolic, but uh, it's definitely a big part of the future of gaming. I think it's the same sentiment people had when free to play came around. Uh, and then suddenly it was, you know, half of the revenue of the entire game industry. Um, it, it's like, you can't beat free, I think is uh, how, how like some people I know said <laughs> it. Um, and that, it, I will say this, uh, the game industry and the, some of the, a lot of the people in the game industry, game industry kind of like bifurcated between um, a few different camps. Uh, and there's a heavy resistance to, um, business strategy and business model changes, right? And free to play was an example of that. Um, I think that the, um, blockchain games are the next iteration of that, but not everything is free to play, right? In the same, and in that same way, not everything's gonna be a blockchain game. But to me, it opens up a new, a new um, business model and potential shape of game. It's some of it's going to be derivative in the same way free to play was derivative of design patterns and free to play was easier adoption because all of the tools existed in maturity already. It was sort of like merging them together with a different business model design, right? We already had like the telemetry required. People were used to, you know, live services and, and war rooms, like the, the game technology and the design patterns were there already. It was just like, oh, let's make this free to play and figure out a different way to monetize effectively and to use all this, all this like existing technology and prowess. Whereas with blockchain, it's like, we're still figuring out the like technology to a certain degree, especially as it applies to games. Um, Cause you know, we have very complex design patterns. Um, so there's a lot going on. And I think it's also because the, ex the blockchain expressions like decentralized expressions are still nascent. Like we're still, it was very like finance driven from the get go. And we're just now finding these like social expressions uh, that can exist in the space, right? And for us, like gameplay expressions. So um, because of that, it's a it's a much higher you know hurdle in order to get to that adoption phase. But yeah, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't think it was it was like the next you know the next big thing in gaming effectively. But I don't think it's gonna you know you're not gonna see God of War the next God of War suddenly have like blockchain integration, unless it's at some, you know, Sony platform level of like an achievement system or something like that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty nuts if you saw like, yeah, a whole ecosystem like Xbox or Sony. They filed a patent for effectively that like NFT, uh, like cross portfolio usage thing. And I'm like, it, like good luck defending it, I guess. But, um, uh, you know, they have a lot of signals at Sony about what their intentions are for the future. So what is it like with music? So like when music went from like, you used to buy an album to like, you know, you stream on Spotify, was it a similar impact on the gaming industry where it's like, it went from, you know, you paid 50 bucks for a game to like, it's now free or, or are people making more money with free to play? Like, how does that work? I mean, it's a case by case basis. There's certainly 
um, breakouts. You know, Grand Theft Auto has been making money hand over fist forever and ever. Um, <laughs> but if you look at the large, you know, maybe not this last couple of years, but at one, you know, PUBG Mobile uh, was the highest grossing game like for multiple years, right? Um, once they transferred from um, you know a, a PC and console game to mobile space as a free to play game, suddenly was like the highest revenue in the entire industry. So uh, you know it's it I wouldn't say in aggregate I'd have to look at the stats in terms of like the total free to play versus the total kind of pay to play. Um, uh, I don't know how heavily weighted it is, but you know the I would say the outliers, you know the the extreme examples free to play has the highest potential but there's also like a gajillion of them that you'll never hear yeah. about right and and there are especially in mobile it's cuz you can make one for you know 50k real quick you know over the course of whatever a few months and then put it on the app store like that they've made the the funnel and the like the journey of getting something deployed that way very easy and as a result there's just like a lot of kind of low effort garbage in the space. So, so what's been your journey then with this kind of new almost fundraising method of like with crypto? Like you guys have a token, you guys are doing sort of your, your extraction packs. So maybe that's a little bit NFT related. I'm not sure. But like what's been your fundraising versus like tr traditional, like however a game gets funded? Uh, I mean, we're, a, you know, kind of a, a blend, I guess. Um, okay. you know, certainly we, we just launched um, the, like the token launched November 8th, I think it was. So that's in the wild now, but you know our funding from the very beginning was was traditional equity funding. Um, with we had a two, we were lucky enough because of our team and our vision. I guess um, we're able to um, kind of pick and choose the uh, investors that we wanted. So and we knew from the get go we wanted one game industry like heavy game VC and one blockchain. So it, you know Griffin and Polychain are two VC like leads. Um, so we've had two rounds now. We had a um, seed funding round and then a series A. Uh, and actually Griffin and Polychain led the series A, um, which is always a good, you know, a bullish signal for us. So we were happy about it. Um, and of course, at that point, you're starting to attract a lot more attention. Um, so it's, it's you know, it's been a, a blend. Um, I would say on the on the like blockchain side, we think a lot more about the crypto that we do as community acquisition and like reward and the, and the, the kind of like economic flow of the game. Um, we look at something like our operators collection was an NFT collection we did. And that was very much tied to um, transmedia storytelling. So the operators and it, it was like we had a super low mint price. It was basically just to so it didn't get botted. Um, uh, and we, like we uh, on the front page of OpenSea for five weeks in a row. We had five different characters. We did um, 2,000 of each for each week. Uh, and they were tied to a comic book series that we made. That was a shrapnel comic book series. And we just actually just launched our second one because it's been that long now. Um, so there's 10 comic books or 11 comic books, I think maybe. Um, uh, and it's sort of like in Transmedia, you're telling a story in the fictional universe. So it's it's within shrapnel, but it's these it's not like the main character story or some like main story. It's these, it's like, you know, the, the, you know, the like parent and child trying to like make it through some specific situation or these people who get like caught out in the middle of a bad situation, trying to get out of it. And you're just kind of like learning more and more and getting this extra texture of the universe through this different medium. Um, so we, you know, we did the operators collection, tied it to the comic books. Everyone got like airdrops of the comic books. And it's really, it's like our founder's pass, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and even though it was cheap, it was just more like, hey, we want to get people interested in, in here. And those people are also, you know, lively in our Discord and community. And they represent kind of this this inside group of people that we talk to and that, you know, sometimes get to play the game. Sometimes we like fly people out here to even do like play tests and stuff, although that'd be, become much easier in the next couple months. Um, so the, uh, you know, that that's the way I think we've thought about that side of, of the house um, for the most part, you know, moving forward. So, so has there, I guess, <clears throat> has there been like big differences in like, I guess, maybe traditionally you have like pre-orders and different things like that, but it, it sounds like you have already avenues for revenue streams for the games even out. And then I guess you're looking at, in, in looking at the full picture of it, you got to have a lot 
more opportunities maybe for revenue streams. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we've, you know, uh, if you're an operator holder, then you get a bunch of stuff like forever. Um, one of those things, so if we're doing an early access phase, um, that's, that's lighting up extremely soon. Uh, and in order to get into the early access phase, you have to, own, you have to buy an extraction pack. And that's, that's actually like, a um, it's not crypto at all. It's a entitlement account entitlement, a very familiar gamer thing, right? I'm buying this pass that just gives me access. Now, as a result, you do get like a bunch of skins and, and, and like equipment and stuff that is, you know, those are NFTs. Um, and those will be like completely tradable. Um, but it was, so, um, we, you know, we try to do these things where it's like, all right, we're going to do an example of that first and then an example of this first. Cool. Like we're good. That's scalable. We're like reliable. We have customer service, like all the things you need for a proper project and product. Um, so we, you know, we very much did that as a, um, uh, a initial turn on of that kind of like, there's going to be fiat parts of this, you know, revenue stream and economy. And we're launching early access. We want concurrency and people to play. We're going to give them missions to go through for which there will be um, a bunch of rewards that are associated with like leaderboards and stuff like that. Um, uh, in addition to that, like we have a marketplace that's lighting up at almost the same exact time where people will be trading um, some of the stuff they're collecting in, in play sessions that can then be used to craft like skins that are um, unique for the actual play sessions. We'll also be just directly selling skins um, for Shrap that you can only get through the marketplace. And then we're bringing the creator tools online so that it's not just us in there, like people are creating additional stuff and putting it in the marketplace as well. Um, and so from, you know, from our perspective, from a revenue stream perspective, there's a, like a bunch of, and this is what I meant by the economic pillars. There's like a bunch of stuff. Um, some of it's direct sale. Some of it's just uh, like marketplace uh, premiums and transactions. Um, some of it's direct like fiat stuff. And we have a lot of it that we have planned over the, you know, the course of next year, really, um, to, to start peeling in. We don't want it to be like both from a stability perspective, but also like people are paying for early access. We're not going to just like dump a bunch of monetization features on them right at the get go. Yeah. And we're certainly not going to have it like egregiously, you know, priced or overburdened. Like we really, we just want to see how people behave, uh, what they feel about, you know, certain pieces with this works, this doesn't. Um, and then kind of navigate through that to make the final shape of it something that's going to like perform the best. Yeah. When I think of like crypto and like ownership on the blockchain, I think of almost the opposite that like uh, you are enabling because a, a lot of people outside of maybe the crypto industry, they'll look at NFTs and they'll think, oh, this is like just the worst kind of monetization possible. But really, it's the exact opposite for players. You're taking an asset that you before couldn't own and giving ownership to the players. And so these people that have spent like thousands of dollars on Fortnite skins, they're never going to get any value back from that. That's locked in that game forever. They have, they can only use it, but they will, they will never be able to redeem that value where with something like shrapnel, yeah, say they spent a thousand dollars on skin on skins. Maybe that thousand dollars is worth 2000 now, maybe 3000, maybe it's not, maybe it's worth $900. Any way you put it, you can now take that value. And if say you want to say you want to leave the ecosystem, you can e extract that value back out. That is inherently like a thousand times way better for players uh, than what you had before, because these loot boxes and things that they were getting before, that was just a one-way money uh, you know, funnel. And now it's a two-way relationship. And, and uh, that inherently makes the gaming experience way better. Um, is, is that how you guys feel about it too? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. It also makes our job in terms of um, you know participating in kind of like the the skins market, uh, or uh, like it makes it considerably more complicated, right? which is why we have somebody who does nothing but looks after macroeconomics, um, which is our head of economy. And then we have our creative director is very much player progression, like re you know, retention, like the second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour, like he's very focused on that. And they constantly are meeting and butting heads and like figuring out what the best shape is. Because when you talk about you know, secondary market or being able to make your own stuff as primary market, and then secondary market um, of, uh, you know, whether it's UGC stuff or stuff that Shrapnel, you know, Shrapnel official is making, um, you now have to consider, you're like, well, now scarcity is important to a certain degree, which normally isn't a thing. Normally it's just a microeconomic 
um, demand side pricing strategy, right? When a when uh, Fortnite is like, what do we, how are we going to sell this skin? Their pricing uh, strategy is entirely based on surveys, like what the other, you know, cannibalizing other sales that are happening at the same time. If they're licensing stuff, like what the licensing agreement, I'd like it's a very traditional, just digital marketplace approach. Um, we can't do that, right? Because all of this stuff is legitimately owned. It's now part of the, the like circulating assets that are in Shrapnel. So it it makes that a little more complicated, um, but like we're prepared for it and we're here for it. It's why we're doing what we're doing. We think it's it's important and it's the future. It's you know it's a legitimate version of the kind of CS:GO like side trading schemes. Is that another revenue stream for you guys? Like the secondary market sales. So like if somebody sells the skin. Do you guys get a cut of that revenue? We do. We do. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, on our marketplace, at least we do. So that's the other, we take the Gabe Newell approach, which is like, you know, the reason people pirate games instead of using Steam is because it's more convenient to them from a cost perspective, right? It's the, the value of using a platform like Steam makes sense because pirating comes with risks and additional friction. Like the marketplace has to be as easy and frictionless and sexy as possible so that like otherwise people are going to trade stuff elsewhere and certainly in this space it's even more available like they can you know use the the like transfer out and in functions that are already on the accounts um and uh, like allow people to move their assets wherever they want so it's in our best interest to make that experience like amazing and awesome um but you know there's there's especially with the the type of audience we're going to soon heavily be marketing towards they're not going to like care about any of that like eventually like our goal is eventually they will right we'll have either direct transfers between other like partnered games and platforms or you know they'll learn about how to hook you know get a metamask wallet and hook it up and start to play in that space but a lot of them are going to come in and just see like oh i can make an insignia or make a weapon skin or buy this skin. And, oh, there's a marketplace where I can trade it for strap. And like, that will be the entire boundary of how they think about stuff. Um, and that the more you have like web two audience, the more that's all they'll see. But if, if you become rabid in something, right, you start to get like really interested in, then you find all the boundaries. And that's where, that's where you get that like bona fide web two to web three kind of mentality and adoption. And hopefully at the same time, we start to see all of the like scary frictional elements get refined and, and kind of go away, you know, in the larger ecosystem as well. How do you see that with like retention? Like in my mind, if you're a player, cause I've played a couple of crypto games and I don't want to, like, I, I don't even have time to play these games, but I keep going back to them. Like, and I understand what I'm doing and I still do it because I'm like, man, but if I earn these things right now, like what happens in the bull market hits and these are worth money. And like, when that comes to skins or maybe that's resources or whatever, do you think inherently like you're going to see just a different level of player retention because, you know, people are just going to want, they won't know if it's worth money or not, but they're going to, they're going to want to be early cause, and just see. Yeah. A hundred, I a hundred percent anticipate um, the different cohorts um, behaving differently. And there, there was, I'm trying to remember what game it was, had a, um, they had a, a bunch of data from an, a kind of an experiment, the, the, not an experiment, but the like data they were collecting, which was they knew where the, their audience was coming from um, based on their own kind of marketing channels, their both acquisition channels. And they were like, this is, these are normal gamers, these are web three gamers, and this is the difference in how they behave. And their metrics broke down by like um, how, how long their initial session was, uh, like the chances of them churning out after the first loss and stuff like that. And then the retention, like day on day, um, I think they they did kind of like what we're going to do for early access at the beginning, which is you can play for this day and then this day, and then there's like a break and then you play for this, you know, where you like focus people together. So their metrics are very much based on those type of like who came back for additional ones. Um, and it, what they found was, I believe, blockchain people um, didn't play as long their initial sessions or churned out faster but like retained at a much higher rate. So they would come back and continue playing, um, but had like, yeah, you know, who, who knows how you're going to interpret that data? Is it because there's other things for them to do, right? And they don't see it worth their time. But I think from a retention perspective, and certainly from a like 
conversion uh, and um, uh, like ARPU perspective, we're going to see completely different metrics, right? Like Web3 people are going to convert and have like ARPU at the highest rates possible. Um, and especially when you talk about different regions of the world and how like they play into that, you look at something like the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, like their ARPU is like 100x what the rest of the world is. And you, you'll and and they're all like play to flex there and everything. You're going to start to see these like gamer cohorts pop out that um, we never expected. And, like the whole whale minnow, uh, like dolphin, like strata is going to. I think it's going to stretch, and you're going to see extremes that we've never seen before. You know, in in something commensurate like a pure free to uh, free to play. Because that's because at the end of the day, retention is sort of all that matters in that. You could start out with a thousand players playing shrapnel, but if your retention, like if you're compounding over time, uh, say like, you know, every month you have an, it doubles, like pretty soon you're going to be the biggest game on the planet. And I can't imagine with like a traditional game, uh, you know, somebody might jump in, they, they try it out. They have no necessarily necessary incentive to out of the gate, buy any of the skins. And, you know, if they don't like the game, they're not going to come back. But we have seen clearly in web three games, even if players don't, always like the game they will start out they will they will buy assets right from the get-go as collectibles because they're, they're not they're not they're buying them for a different reason they're not buying them to flex they're buying them because the same reason people buy pokemon cards or you know uh my dad used to collect like mcdonald's like happy meal toys he thought that they might be worth money someday <laughs> kind of a weird thing but people do weird stuff like that all the time right um because they think it could be a collectible one day and so it's the same thing with antiques, et cetera. And so you're going to have people that in inherently jump in, they buy these things out the get-go just because they want to collect them. And they keep checking back in for those same reasons. So, and if you can get those retention numbers to be you know, higher than a traditional game and it's fun, then it's only a matter of time before you become one of the dominating forces on the planet as far as games go. And especially if you're like, if you're as fun as Call of Duty and, and Fortnite, et cetera, and you have all the same kind of features, but you have this added layer that they can't provide on top that that's when things get pretty insane and you start to see like people really catching on and i also think that a player who has financial stake in a game because not only do they have ownership of assets but it kind of feels like they own the game like in, in a weird different way like they are a part of that game in, in a way that another game can't provide and so they're way more likely to convert their friends because they they want their friends getting in that game. They want more people. Look at people with a, you know any random token, a meme coin. They'll take that thing to a billion dollars just based on you know community uh, pulling people together. So what are they going to do for a game that they love and say, hey, come play this? I'm not playing Fortnite with you tonight. We're going to go play Shrapnel because I I got two hundred you know bucks and skins on Shrapnel and I want you to come play this game with me because we're going to farm you know resources tonight or whatever. So man, that that gets me pumped. That gets me really yeah. pumped. That that network effect is huge. Like social network effect is, you know, we usually measure that on every game that I've ever made, which is like friend friend referrals, who's playing together. Like when it, you basically get like a, a player for life when you can get people like playing with their friends, um, or even just like drawing their friends into have the same discussions, whether it's water cooler style or not. Yeah, when I play with my friends, it's like um, it's usually just to hang out. So it doesn't really matter the game or the game mode we're playing. It's usually just to talk. So it's like. Man, if I could be farming resources while we're talking, let's do that. <laughs> um, yep. My question is with Shrapnel, what is the guy like the grand vision for it? Is it like, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, where you said it's kind of like a mature sort of version of like maybe a Rob Roblox or uh, Minecraft. Um, it, it, is that kind of like the focus? Like you want it to be like, um, sort of like how Fortnite's kind of become almost this metaverse sort of game. Uh, is that the focus or is it like more like Apex or Call of Duty where it's like, no, it's going to have elements of that, but it's still going to just primarily be a shooter? Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. From a game mode perspective. Yeah, from I mean, a game mode talked about, yeah, of like expanding the game mode. The thing is, um, with uh, digital asset ownership on the line, uh, you have to put very real boundaries on um, like mode expression, game rules expression, right? So... Um, we've talked about what that will look like in the future, but right now we're laser focused on the extraction mode. So when people make maps, it's the extraction mode map. And there's actually a service that um, uh, seeds the loot. It's a loot population service. Um, so you don't even do that when you're building a map. It, like the service goes in and does it for you. Otherwise, you have these like abuse vectors. I don't yeah. know if you ever play, do you ever play the um, Little Big Planet? 
the medium I, I molecule no. game. So it, you know, it's it's a side scrolly, but it has you know kind of like a phys physically uh, real look to it. Um, and they had a they have just like comprehensive user generation uh, user generated content tool set, right? That even from like the first day, there was just thousands of levels that you could play that people were building with this like amazing tool set. Uh, and it it's kind of like what you're describing, where you can do whatever you want. Like you can you can make a racing game in it. Like you can do anything that you want, right? Um, the highest rated level on the first day, and that continued to be the highest rated level for the entire duration of the project's life is a, a map called get all achievements. And you just, you select it and you spawn into it and you put the controller down and it flies your character through this map. And when it's done, you have all the achievements for the game. <laughs> so that <laughs> that is an example of the ingenuity of creator, of what people do with creator tools and how you have to be aware of like, the boundaries that need to be there because that to could ensure... really screw your economy it makes like my kids when they're like playing uh, minecraft on creative first thing they do is like okay let's you know make our buildings out of diamonds and you know all that stuff so they can have all the best stuff right away so that makes sense like you don't want players to be able to abuse your economy because that would literally ruin the whole game yep <laughs> yeah so when when we when we look at like that space that gets into uh, you know, I, I alluded to it a little bit before like our our um, code name game bridge back end it's sort of like the xbox live um what what it did to enable a halo 2 multiplayer and then like social features and like all of that matchmaking all that stuff beyond like we've had to build it because if we're building shrapnel which we think is like our competitive advantage in that space is like we're not just building infrastructure like we're building it for a triple a game with high scalability and we and like crazy expression of what the, the actual blockchain elements are so you know the the grander vision as opposed to just even what's in shrapnel of that is what other games we can make or other you know partner studios are going to make that utilize that same that same framework right so we very much it's like that's always in there um as well when we start talking about expanded shrapnel tool sets it's like if you keep your you look at the lighthouse that's three years out like that's probably the brighter lighthouse yeah you kind of mentioned it earlier like uh this kind of almost uh you didn't call it a metaverse you called it something else but like this, this focus multiverse. where yep. multiverse where you can use those assets across different games but some of those games inherently probably will get created by your team right like that make the most sense that like you guys would be the one to create that racing game or that whatever and, and that brings a lot more value i think players are more likely to convert to that game, especially if they have like, you know, a grand in assets on Shrapnel, and then you release a racing game that like gives their, gives more utility to their assets or like whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a racing game. Um, I, I think they're more likely to go check that out, um, want to like it and to convert over to it because now their, their assets just got twice the utility, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I, it's, a, it's a user acquisition um, play, but also a user reacquisition play, right? <laughs> yeah. You're you're now Zynga was actually the master of this in its hey its Facebook heyday. They called it the fire hose. I like you know worked with a, a lot of those people for uh, a bit, and they called it the fire hose, where um, they were able to when they launched a new product, um, they were able to just like fire hose their user base over to the new game, right? Uh, it's the same sort of deal, and then they could pull them back and forth, uh, and however they wanted to, like a new feature here, we're going to experiment here, right? Uh, it it just creates this space where, like you said, people have stuff and, and value, and they don't feel like they're, um, you know, like net new or getting left behind. And the more that we can do from a like itemization agency perspective, the better, because then you, you really feel like you're never wasting your time, no matter it's, and then it becomes about where you actually want to go based on, you know, your mood and what you think is fun that day or what your like friends want to play or something like that. And that's, that's always like thinking that's not going to happen, that there's not going to be new games and new experiences and fresh stuff people are going to play is folly. Like that's always going to be the case. The question is, are they going to come back when you have new stuff? in your game, right? Like, how do you how do you make that seem like they're not wasting their time? Maybe for like somebody who isn't familiar with extraction shooters, can you kind of outline exactly how like a shrapnel gameplay session might look with the extraction element where like they're dropping into, it's the, is it called the zone, right? Yeah, the sacrifice zone, the zone. The, the sacrifice yeah, zone. Yep. They're dropping into the sacrifice zone. How does that look from, um, 
you know, how does that gameplay experience feel with the the crypto elements, the NFT elements? Um, kind of just explain that. Out. So yeah, you choose your loadout. So you're, you're coming in with um, with assets, right? Uh, weapons and equipment. Um, there, it is a free to play game. So there's a notion where uh, those are not like assets of value yet. Uh, there's a there's a process you go through. You basically have to play. You can play with free stuff, but you have to play before it effectively, like implicitly converts into something of value. Um, and then, then it becomes like tradable effectively if you if you did want to trade it. That said, like weapons and equipment is a highly liquid part of the economy. Um, you because you can lose it, and because we wanted to incentivize people always bringing like their dopest gear. Right? I didn't want you to be. A, oh, this is the greatest sniper rifle in the world, but I'm never going to bring in a session because I don't want to lose it. Like that's a terrible thing for a gamer to do. So you know, even though those are assets and you own them, it's it is highly liquid and uh, it, it will be partially player driven. But I see that as just this like very low level economy, right? Um, you can't lose your um, things like skins, uh, aesthetics, stuff that you can mint as a player. Um, yourself, you can't lose any of that stuff that you're like buying as a cosmetic. You can't lose it. You're you're basically applying it to a piece of equipment. But if you lose the equipment, you don't lose that. Um, so like again, we wanted people to make themselves look the way they wanted without the fear of like constantly losing it. Yeah, right? that sucks. So it, it there's there's still a spicy element to it, which is you can still lose stuff that has value, and you can still like get it off of somebody else and get it out. And you know, based on the kind of people's play style and efficacy and some of the rarity of stuff, like there will still be um, kind of a, um, a value graph to it effectively. Um, but, you know, you choose what you want to bring in. Your equipment, weapons and equipment will dictate kind of your play style. Some people will have weapons and equipment that's tailored towards getting out early. Um, so there's multiple phases of extraction that happen over the course of the session. Uh, and we, um, seed loot, like the the stuff that you can get in the session becomes more valuable over time. Um, so, you know, there's the stuff that you're getting. There's also a resource called Sigma, um, which in the fiction of the of um, Shrapnel is something that was in the asteroid that collided with the moon that's now on the Earth. It's basically the next conflict mineral. Um, it's a, um, has, it's a like compound that has these like quantum properties and becomes the most valuable um, um, uh, compound on the face of the planet. And that's why there's all these like, you know, military forces that, it, that some of them are like not even traditional military forces it, like spawned a whole nother, you know, military economy basically to go like fight over getting Sigma. So you're collecting Sigma over the course of the session. And as you collect it uh, in your um, containment unit, it also powers up abilities that you have. So the, those like properties uh, the quantum properties have like spawned this new like technological innovation um, that's just like a crazy you know physics space uh, that give you um, abilities that like utilize its properties. So the more you get, the more powerful you become effectively, depending on how you did your loadout. So there's this intercession leveling that's very much based on your sigma collection. And by the the end, by the what we call final extractions. Um, by that point, like every, if you're in there and you haven't collected a bunch of Sigma, like good luck, because <laughs> that's when it's basically goes goes from like a shooter at the beginning to the Superman feeling thing at the end, um, because everybody's stuff is just so powerful. But some people are going to want to get out early, right? Some people will bring a kit that allows them to stealth themselves to like know what, you know, to be able to like detect other people and it'll come at, at, at like a cost of them not powering up as much over the course of the session. Like the abilities they bring in don't have the power curve that allows them to go like head to head with people at the end. So it, you know, the session story very much is defined by you and how you want to play, like how cautious around the edges you are, or are you 360, you know, no scope rocket jumper, uh, who's, who's like going into the end every time, like you're always betting, even when people go all in, if you're that type of personality, you're coming in with the power curve equipment and that's the way you're going to play. And then, you know, you're probably going to going to be like super happy. It'll be feast or famine, super happy or super sad, depending on how the session plays out. Dude, I could imagine like <clears throat> influencers, like streamers dropping in with like, you know, I dropped in with this $50,000 gun. Let's see if I survive to final extraction or whatever, you know. 
all kinds. Of <laughs> so, so we do, um, you know, internally we call that pink slip mode. Um, we do because you know the mode I described is very much for gamers, where it's you don't want to lose the fifty thousand dollar thing, right? But there is a certain type of person who does like, and that's that is like a great style of gameplay. It's very watchable, obviously, um, but like most people will just eject from your your game immediately if that's what's at stake all the time so that's um you know that is a very it needs to be an explicit thing like you know what you're getting into you know what you're bringing in it's got to be um the, the like risk reward has to be appropriate for the people who are playing in that style of mode yeah i imagine most people will have like a more more of a minimum viable loadout that they take into the game but i was more saying like from um just like streamers dictate so much of like what games are popular and what aren't and you've added this almost like Mr. Beastification into the game that like they couldn't previously access, right? Like they couldn't previously, you know, have like a say it's not 50,000, like 5,000 or a gun or whatever that they drop in with. And like the stakes are so much higher that like that's really good entertainment for them. And like they'll, oh, yeah. they'll do that all day long. And that and that'll get a lot of views too. And so then that inherently, again, brings more and more attention back to Shrapnel because people are like, what is, what is this game? How are they doing this? How is this gun worth, you know, 500 bucks or a thousand bucks or, you know, whatever? Um, I, I don't know. It just, it gets me excited again, because it, it's another reason that you're going to have more attention on games like this than you are going to have over a traditional game, because th it's, there's so many new elements to it that like a traditional game just can't match in, in those same ways. Yeah. We, we actually have a pretty large initiative internally about that, that like watchability. Um, we, we loosely just call it our esports um, initiative, but it, in, it, it really is, um, not everybody's gonna want to get in all the time and, and like play sweaty matches, right? Like the watchability and the ability for existing organizations, existing networks of people to create um, tournament structures or competitive structures where they're defining kind of the rules and and like the stakes um, is a it like we are strong believers in that grassroots style of um, the, it, you know letting those networks like, do what they want to do anyway and and. If, as opposed to the like Overwatch League approach of making people pay millions of dollars just to like have an, uh, you know, your org be part of a league, um, we are far more like believers in that that like grassroots approach. So that is something we are 100% chasing after, or like laying some of the business relationship parts of it now. Um, definitely have the like technical infrastructure from a player created tournament perspective. Um, so it's all it'll be like part of the rollout, you know, as we go through next year and and start kind of incrementally um, introducing features for people. Okay, what is the like number one game on the planet right now in, in your category? In uh, in, extraction, in the category of like first person shooters. Well, in that it's it's um, COD Go. It's always COD Go. God, God, God Go is that a mobile game? COD, no, or sorry, not COD Go. Um, CS Go. CS Go. Uh, Counter Strike Global Offensive is uh, if you look at concurrency on any given day like csgo is always at the top cod cod comes in and and has like waves it's very popular for the first week or two and then um it's hard it, like it's harder for them to maintain uh like a constant player base in the same way as counter-strike counter-strike has 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 been the top of that list forever and ever right um C can you see one day shrapnel surpassing that game i think I think maybe, you know, we certainly a goal we have internally. Um, the thing in Counter-Strike is when you look at their metrics, it's just people getting in there, getting sweaty. Whereas for something like Shrapnel, it's a amalgamation of people creating stuff, people like trading, speculating, socializing, right? All of that. All of that is it, as, as important to us as the game and the concurrency of people like in matches itself. So I think from that, kind of aggregated stat level yeah we, we we definitely get there um getting the concurrency the counter-strike has the thing what's like some of the there's so many pieces to it one is um players are super sticky in that space these are people who, like a lot of those people have been playing counter-strike for 10 years right and it's really hard to let go of that sort of thing um uh the other is it's a highly compartmentalized competitive game right like valorant where they have this tight session structure where like everyone's doing the kind of the same set of plays and moves they know exactly where people are going to come from which is a little bit the antithesis of how our game structure and game design is um so 
you know, it's a different type of player, really. And and the um, the last point is just the addressable audience from a machine level, like Counter Strike. You can play on, you know, a, like a TI eighty five calculator almost. Uh, it, it'll run on anything in the world. Um, our, we're building our game to have it's you know at least slightly higher system requirements because we are utilizing things like you know global illumination um, for lighting in the level and just uh, like a higher resolution and fidelity of experience. Whereas Counter Strike, you can play and have it look like a complete potato um, and still, you know. Be, be okay in that space like we're not going to be in that space at all got it got it well what would you say would happen if say like a game like yours or any crypto game like hit like top five games on the planet is that like is that the moment when everyone's like whoa wait what is this i mean just from a game perspective yes right like the the crypto side i think i think it'll be a stealth piece right i think it'll 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 be more like people focus on just the game itself and oh all the stuff that i can do here but i can't do elsewhere and then all, all the like dgens like ourselves who are you know in the wings like i told you so uh nobody will care because it'll be the the hundreds of millions of people that only care about what they can do and then why can't this other game do these same things like that that will be what they actually care about i, I guess i mean more from like a game studio perspective is that the moment when you see like you know, big games that are like, wait a minute, I, I need to pay attention to what's going on here. Or, or are they already doing that? Or is there already, are they already looking around and saying, wow, this is definitely something? Oh, they're definitely already looking around. <laughs> That's been going on for a couple of years <laughs> yeah. at least already. Oh yeah. I mean, all of the big publishers have blockchain teams. Um, the scale of them is different between all of the big publishers. It's mostly a, um, you know, PR risk, uh, um, uh, like how they launch things from a business model perspective, like how they mitigate that PR risk, that sort of like most Got of the it. plays and the movements that are being made, waiting for regulatory guidance based on the different regions, you know, that, that they have their players in. So um, I think we'll likely, there's a lot of operational expertise that's required aside from just like the technical side, knowing how to like, from a customer service perspective, from uh, um, like, uh, an infrastructure perspective from a ta you know, accounting and taxing perspective, like how does this all work in this space? Because it's pretty, pretty like untread territory. Um, I think that's where, uh, you know, large publishers, that's when something like Shrapnel is in hard acquisition target land where a Microsoft, right. And Microsoft Activision now really um, will just hoover up a studio like ours to absorb that expertise at an extremely high premium. Got it. That makes sense. It's always the kind of the smaller, uh, newer studios that are like maybe the innovators. And then, you know, they wait to see the innovation play out. And if it's successful, then of course they jump in that strategy. But totally. They're, they're risk averse, right? I worked at Microsoft, uh, Xbox for six years. We had Xbox people here playing the game like a few weeks ago. Uh, so, you know, we like, we know all those people and they're like, we're always talking with everyone. Um, but you can hear it even in the conversations that we have. I'm like, oh, I remember what it's like to have to be that risk averse in literally everything that you do. Um, like we will be, well, we, we can take those risks. We have, we have a new set of users, right? A new IP. It's completely different. We can navigate, uh, that territory in those waters, um, without incurring the risk of alienating whatever hundreds of millions of existing customers because NFT is bad because you know Kotaku told me so is this something that you could bring to consoles eventually like could shrapnel yeah yeah oh yeah is there yeah. are there plans to do that uh we're, we we want to be on mobile first we think we'll be on mobile first um that like we're far much further along on those plans than we are on console plans i mean this is the reason you know we have groups like xbox um coming out to play um it, it's a, entirely a policy thing right it's a policy wall. Technically, we could be on console, but we'd have to make a hard line separation between the blockchain elements uh, and the game that's available to play on the console. Um, and that's not something you know, we're entirely willing to do. Um, uh, you, we have we have some like clever um, architecture that allows us to meet different like compliance and regulatory requirements in different regions. Um, we have a, a system called constructive receipt that like 
determines how NFTs flow and are owned based on what people want to do with them. Um, and uh, that puts us probably in like a better architectural position than a lot of just pure blockchain games that would need to just, you know, cut the game off basically. Um, but that is a level of, of like um, complexity that's very difficult to have a conversation with somebody at one of those like console publishers. They're really what they want is to make sure you know, it's a three, it's a three part thing to make sure that their audience isn't going to get alienated, um, to make sure they're not going to get sued and to make sure they get the cut that they want. Right. Like those are the three things they care about the most. So they want to make sure it's like, they don't want blockchain games, be, uh, in the, in the awkward in between where you're not using or reflecting your payment, uh, uh to their platform fees. Um, but they can't, officially recognize blockchain because from a regulatory perspective they're not sure how to handle it they don't have the prowess to handle it so it's like well you just can't be on here because we're not going to make the money that we think we should off of it for all of these other reasons so once once that policy hurdle like it needs once it gets to the point where like blockchain games are a 600 billion dollar a year industry then they have no choice right but to be like oh we, like we have to figure this out because we're not part of that 600 billion dollar part of the industry i was gonna that's literally what i was gonna ask next was like at what point do they do they have to you know get into that what what made you guys i know you guys are on like an avalanche subnet what made you guys decide to do that over something like immutable or polygon yeah i mean we talked to everyone right including immutable and polygon um in the early days um uh, some some chain like L1s. I don't even know if they exist anymore. Uh, ultimately, it was um, tech technical reasons and partners. Yeah, they're really good partners. They were at the right stage of development. Um, we felt fundamentally the kind of sovereign blockchain um, uh, approach took took things that are typically trade offs in blockchain land and made them just like wins in multiple categories. Things like uh, the security and compliance uh, that that we can have our own blockchain and make sure like who can actually you know like publish contracts who are the validators how does that work not sharing block space on an entirely you know pub public blockchain especially it was like in the early days was right when Solana kept falling over like every two weeks um, so it's like yeah we we need to make it so if Fortnite has a good day Shrapnel doesn't fall over. Right, so the the blockchain yeah. version of the noisy neighbor problem in cloud computing, um, so uh, and th those those like pieces kind of put together, and because of what we wanted to do from a transaction perspective, uh, and what we think is kind of the game, um, how games on blockchains should really work, which is, uh, you know, we we devised not just our um, subnet, but also like how it works with GameBridge, to be a gasless environment. Um, so it, it, there is gas, but uh, it's not something that's um, like a publicly traded token or something people care about. It's necessary for the consensus mechanism for the like queuing of transactions and operations to work. Um, but it's not how validators are rewarded and they're rewarded with Shrap. Um, so it's uh, in, in like on a different scheme and Shrap itself is a utility token. It's this thing, you know, that's a like a commerce vehicle for the game and it's a thing that you can use for like um, um, like um, promoting uh, content within the like the, the node structure within like maps in the marketplace um, so we wanted to we, we were like we need to do millions of transactions uh, the val and we need it not to like get slowed down by that and we need it to not cost have these like violent you know um, cost increases based on that activity that's not what gamers expect, right? They're not going to be like, hey, I want to loot this thing off the ground and extract with it. And for some reason, it like costs me something or shrapnel has to absorb that cost because the gas fees are through the roof because we're popular. Like that's a terrible, a terrible notion. And we, like, we strongly believe other games are going to have that exact same space, at least like games that have the kind of same philosophy and approach that we do. So like all of those pieces kind of got put together as uh, into the like culmination of the decision that this is the tech stack that we need to use and they've been great partners you know it's like never uh, nothing's ever perfect from the start we're always just like finding like new and better ways to orchestrate and architect stuff um with them and um at, like it's one of the there's always decisions that you question in the past it's one of them we like haven't 
questioned at all. It's been like the greatest decision ever. With the rewards and incentives with Shrap, you mentioned that earlier. How are you guys planning on doing that? Is it that going to be like, um, cause I, I know some game economies have struggled with that. Like they give out too many rewards. It like dilutes the token value causes like that. It, it really backfires on the game because you know, suddenly the token value goes down. A lot of people get upset and it kind of causes this negative kind of feedback loop for the game. How do you guys plan on handling that? So token, re I mean, it, it's based, we use a very like production um, basis for it, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, the amount of stuff people need to do or are doing to have tokens as a reward. A lot of it is based around um, content creation, certainly from the player side of things, especially in early stages. Uh, it's around like player missions and having them like accomplish certain like feats and tasks. And a lot of that's because of the phase that we're in um, from uh, a development perspective. A notion of that will exist um, forever moving into the future. Like we will always have like to token mission rewards for players. Um, but a lot of the reward structure is um, primarily around creation. So you, you like, you need to make dope shit that people want in order to actually get you know, a, a good cut of that reward protocol. Um, the other portion of it is also promotion of content because you know, when in the, in the popularity contest problem, you have the app store problem where there's a hundred thousand things going in every day, like, how do you know and determine what gets in front of your face? So like, those are networks of people. Those are like rock stars with really good um, reputations. Um, so people um, can actually like um, promote other people uh, with a, uh, it's kind of, it's not a direct, but uh, with a token mechanism effectively, they can't, they can't um, make them succeed. So there has to be organic performance for that content, but they can promote stuff uh, so that it gets in front of more people's faces, which is an important part of it, right? So part of the reward structure is also having the network of humans do the work of finding good stuff and putting it in front of people's faces um, and like and creating a system and a structure where you genuinely want it to be the, the best stuff. Otherwise, like you're you know, putting your token in a place where it's not going to actually get rewarded and perform because it's not performing right with the community. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, the other pieces of that are, are more like token sinks, which is to make stuff right, requires um, strap token to, you know, it's a, a medium of exchange. When you look at the marketplace, not just um, it's for secondary sales, but also for direct purchase. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very much thinking about it in, in that fashion of um, making sure there's a balanced set of liquidity, right? Of, of what those fountains are and what those sinks are, uh, depending on how people want to use it. So if people want to buy something in the game, they got to use the strap token, but is that kind of like abstracted away? So like, you know, what if somebody's not familiar with crypto, how do they, if they have to go buy strap token somewhere or? Yeah, it's just strap. Um, but, you know, currently people have to bridge it in. We don't have a uh, direct fiat yet. Um, so we're literally doing that right now. Um, so yeah, it, it, for somebody who's not crypto savvy, it'll, it just seems like they're buying strap for money. Um, because it's the equivalent would just be a soft currency, right? I need the soft currency to, so it's, it's kind of like the bucks, like they're going to be able to in game, just kind of like buy the strap token. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, one one question I had about the game that I imagine is going to be a huge issue is how, how do you combat like bots and like cheating in, in the game? Yeah, we have a couple partners that we're working with. that are kind of state of the art. Um, I'll loosely describe them as traditional tamper protection, right? You always need to like protect your executable uh, and understand what people are um, running uh, on their machine that could be malicious. Um, the other is um, behavioral detection. So that's like machine learning based backend software uh, or service that is good at um, identifying outliers and behavior based on how people like what people are doing. Um, and that's like, you know, that's like um, event stream. So that's that's like input stream level. Uh, they, they come from a background of um, boosting prevention, like um, uh you know account boosting and rank matches and stuff like that uh they can tell like within seconds who's playing the game 
uh, so that it develops these like personas of humans. Uh, and this is what their background was in, like initially from a business model. It, it develops this like persona of an individual and they could be like, y you know, you hop on my game and you play it. And within seconds, they could be like, that's Jesse playing that game. So okay. those sorts of things you can kind of extrapolate and see that you can you really, there's like that level of abuse of, Hey, you do, you're using like an aimbot, obviously, or uh, you know, whatever, whatever the latest like hack is that people have. Um, and that we have to take action against that because there's like legitimate real world implications to this, as opposed to, you know, people's rank ladder or just, you know, getting hurt in the fields. Is there any other games besides shrapnel that you're like, that are crypto games that you're pretty excited about right now? Uh, I, you know, I've been excited about star Atlas from the very beginning because <laughs> I love, I know, I know. I just, one of my favorite games growing up was a game called uh, wing commander privateer, uh, which is, is sort of like, um, Chris Roberts. I don't know if you've ever seen star citizen. Uh, he's the one who created all of that back in the day. And, um, it, it, it was the, I, like, I just love that style of space game where it's like a giant, you know, galaxy of, people everywhere interesting planets like exploring like the exploration side of it the kind of revealing more and more of the universe to you side of it is always just like has a it's hook creative hooks in me so i've always i've been rooting for star atlas from the very beginning um i know they just had their kind of like like racing game stuff i'm starting to see whispers of the same uh direction that star citizen started doing um gives me like a little bit of concern um, but I'm, I'm still like, I'm rooting for them. Uh, Star you know, the others was, in this... the, was the Kickstarter, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. was, uh, yes. Yeah. I think it was Kickstarter that they yeah, initially went off on, you know, in, and then in, in our, in like shooter space, um, off the grid is definitely on my radar, especially with Neil Blancamp behind it. Um, it, you know, we actually even internally have our own like Blancamp rule here, which is that 70 it has everything has to be 70 percent familiar 30 percent exotic which if you look at his like film aesthetic you know uh it, it's it, like how he approaches it when you see that weapon from the future like well it's an ak underneath but it's just some like weird shit on top of it um so we like we love seeing that sort of like alter approach within this space uh and then of course dead drop um is the other one in the shooter space that we're like keeping an eye on we like i know they call themselves a extraction shooter but it's they, their game mode so exotic i'm like not sure even how to apply that genre to it um and they're very much the the 360 no scope like quake you know pixel hunting days um which which uh, i think i'm too old to play that style of game right now i just get like completely crushed um but uh you know those are those are kind of in the shooter space those two games are the ones we're keeping much uh, like a close eye on just want to like perform and succeed what about like infrastructure you seen anything kind of like pop up recently where you're like or like tools for crypto gaming where you're like that's that's cool like um anything you know, like that yeah yeah i mean um you know merit circle uh just came out with a big announcement recently um like stardust is evolving really well over time um, uh, you know, ev everything immutable, like, you know, not just their infrastructure, but their business, uh, kind of proposition of play with their, the studios and games that they're supporting. Um, they're all, you know, everyone's got kind of a different approach that is evolving over time. And we like talk, we talk with most of those teams as well. Um, cause we're all, well, because of that, like not divergent, you know, but starting from different places and, and following different paths, but all kind of with the same goal of like making it so that the problem isn't this technical infrastructure side of it, that the problem is designing and creating like the game that people want to play uh, and the rest of it's an afterthought. And we've got a bit of a ways to go, but you know, the, those are, I think the, the big ones in my mind. If you had asked me this like a year and a half ago, I would have said um, a place like Forte was high on my list, but they kind of, um, they took a, I think, way too traditional Web 2 approach um, and were like, yeah, we'll do the Web 3 thing later and kind of isolated themselves from the the more like Stardust at the time, at that same time as like, no, it's a microservice and 
you get to choose your chain and like you know the, the, just their spiritual and like philosophic philosophical approach was way more akin to what like web3 really needs to be what uh what's the launch date for shrapnel we're going to be in early access um uh you mean launch like general availability or early, early access launch early access and general so like early next year is early access launch um we were originally targeting at the end of december but our teams, our teams cooking, uh, and we're like, hey, and once once we're in early access, it ain't gonna stop, right? Yeah. So we're like, you know what? Everyone here is doing dope shit. Uh, like, spend some time with your families, get some downtime, spend spend at least like a week just not thinking about shrapnel, <laughs> please, and then come back with renewed vigor. Um, so you know, we were we're we were cooking hard. Um, and you could see the uh, people like love it here and will like give their all so like in my position and role have to like make that call to yeah uh to let you know let off some steam so um yeah instead of december it's you know going to be you know, probably probably the end of january is when we'll like lift the early access we're doing it in this like focused um you play like during these hours on this day and then there'll be a quiet point por uh, portion we'll do it again and there's missions that people are are with a actually a huge prize pool reward that we're going to do um for that, early like, access we'll, yeah for early access so okay. people jump in there's a, like multiple millions of dollars prize pool uh that we're basically an in strap that we'll be rewarding people with uh over the course of the early access so it's you know we want to like for us uh, it's as much a, a kind of like marketing thing as it is a, like a legitimate development thing. Like we want those types of people who are going to get in that way to give us not just the objective data, but the subjective feedback about how they feel about X, Y, or Z. And we need to build the muscle of um, taking that feedback and making sense of it. It's which is not an easy thing where you're like, what type of player are you? Oh, you're the like this sweaty type or a casual or whatever, right? And it's all self-selected. So then you're like, oh, I got to filter through that. And like, what are your, you know, how do you feel about X, Y, or Z? So we like, we are going to be building that muscle, um, you know, over the course of next year, uh, leading to the general availability. So that'll be when we go completely free to play. All of the monetization pillars are in place. And we're effectively, it's like, if you do that too early is why free to play games fall over, why some of them launch and then like literally a month later close down. Um, you have to do it responsibly. So around, it'll be around this time next year uh, that we effectively flip the free to play switch completely. There's no, you know, no um, extraction pack entitlement required to play the game. You just go on Epic Game Store, hopefully Steam as well. By that point, download the game, jump in, just like play it like any free to play game and start getting, start getting familiar with Shrapnel. But the early access players, they can get the prize pool, but and also they can c collect resources and NFTs? Yes. So there's exclusive... There's a it, uh, there's a crafting system um, they're called fragments in the game, uh, and you uh, basically there's blueprints and the fragments go into the blueprints and then when you have like the ones for a particular skin you can craft that skin, um, and all of that the skins the fragments it's all like tradable on our marketplace so it'll start to create and that's the first like we're gonna create this economy and see how people respond right like what people want. Like, how much are we putting into levels that's too much? Like, what's the price action, all that over time, et cetera, et cetera? Like, the, the you know, supply and demand. Um, but those, the ones, that, uh, you know, they're, they're exclusive to being collected in the game. Then there's another set that's exclusive to people who buy extraction packs. So just on top of getting early access, like, you're getting stuff like exclusive skins. Uh, and then there'll be additional exclusive skins that we're, we're selling to the marketplace. And we have so much like theme stuff. That's just, some of it's like fun. Some of it's um, just like chef's kiss, you know, material <laughs> expressions and carbon fiber and stuff. Um, and we'll basically be doing that over time. The next progress, the next kind of like big feature that'll come online is a progression system. So the operators uh, is like a kind of an overloaded term here, but um, operators are, uh, another thing you don't lose in a session and can never go backwards. So it's it represents effectively a skill tree, like your XP and skill tree, that over time you're opening up like the different things that you want as an expression. Like you like 
you know, running faster or, um, you know, like, uh, um, like re recoil compensation, like that's, that's those sort of kind of, um, um, you know, numerical, but also like qualitative, uh, like perks. And they're it, the, the individual operators have like a style they're, they have their own, like, um, potentials of what can show up in that skill tree, but there's, um, you don't know what it is until you, uh, it's sort of like if you ever played Diablo, I, I, I never have actually played Diablo. Okay. So it's sort of like, there's a set of things that can, that can show up here, but you don't know like which one you're going to get until you open that tier. Right. And as it. you're leveling it up, you're, you're like selecting, oh, that's the best option out of the, th the choices that I have. And that's how I'm going to customize my character. So as you play, you're like leveling up the operators. Um, and then, and those are entirely owned. So every time you hop in a match, you're like, I want to play as that operator. I'm going to play as this operator. Um, those are things that people will be leveling up that they own. that will also be traded in the marketplace. Uh, and there's a bunch of mechanisms around those. It's like, you can use strap to reroll, right? Like some of the traits, if you want to, you're like, ah, I don't really like any of those. I want to like, get, give me a new set from the like limited set of of traits that are available for this particular character i'm familiar with kind of like that concept it's like overwatch it's like apex sort of like th those sort of like where you have um almost like character classes but you're saying a lot more customization in there where it's not like a specific character um but like it's like sort of like a character class but you can customize the elements that are most important to you so it's not like call of duty where like everyone's like the same equal you know character with the equal abilities it's there's a lot more um customization there's, ver there's a lot more variety um the uh it's not like a moba right which is kind of where apex gets gets all of its mechanisms from which is it's it basically is you can always choose the same you know buy or like upgrade route um the, that you want or or even a moba where it's like in the intra session where i start off as this character and decide how i'm going to buy my traits like until the end of the game to actually level up the character it's 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 uh, imagine it it's like that but um at each um at each level you don't know exactly what you're going to get it's still from a um limited set of options that apply to that operator but there's still a degree of like you know there's 12 of them at this tier but only three of them actually show up so if you want like a different set of three to choose from, that's when you have to effectively re-roll. Man, I could keep asking you questions for forever. I just want to respect your time though. And uh, how can people follow along with Shrapnel if, if they want to kind of be informed about updates and, and when things are kind of dropping? What's the best and easiest way for them to follow along? I mean, the the, the best way is to hop in Discord, to be honest. Um, you know, m most of our like news and, and interaction with the community happens there first. Um, Twitter is obviously a great place. Um, you know, definitely the big official news, everything, or a lot of the stuff that's in discord will eventually make, make its way in, into Twitter and, you know, in a minute or a matter of minutes or hours, uh, typically. Um, and then of course, going to the website, signing up for account, like looking for the updates on there right now, it's, uh, very much an informational site with just the user creation tools. The, the insignia editor is actually there already. So if you want to hop in and make, um, your own insignia, so it's sort of like sticker sheet editing. Um, so you can make your own brand, make your own badge effectively, like you can go do that right now. Um, that will be more, there's more and more actions you'll be able to do on the website over time. So people should definitely like sign up for an account because that's going to be like how you do everything in shrapnel. And then, yeah, Discord and Twitter, you know, primary, primary avenue.